this fancy contraption here is a ball machine sculpture where you've got all these little balls that roll around and go through loop the loops and lots of fun stuff like that. With the techniques that we'll learn about work and energy, we'll be able to describe some of the relationships between the height that the balls are traveling down and the speed that they end up acquiring as they do so. We're going to learn about work, kinetic energy, and then the work energy theorem that relates work and kinetic energy, and then power, which is the rate of work. We'll then apply our understanding of that stuff to developing potential energies and be able to use potential energy and conservation of energy to analyze mechanical systems while recognizing that this conservation of energy will actually show up in a lot of different disciplines and a lot of different places throughout many different sciences. First, work. We define work in the context of physics as the integral of our force applied along a path dotted with that path. So if we start from point A and we're going to point B, the work done by a force as it travels, as our object travels along this path, is equal to the integral of whatever the force that's being applied on that object at that point in time is dotted with my little bit of path, my dr along that path. So we integrate along this path. Now I've been saying dotted with, this is a dot product. This is a way of multiplying two vectors together. And our dot product here, f dot dr, gives us the magnitudes times the cosine of the angle between them. So any two vectors, even in three-dimensional space, can define a plane uh, where then you have a shortest angle between those two vectors. And the dot product, if you look at that angle theta between those two vectors in two dimensions, it's pretty straightforward, it's that angle there, will be essentially projecting one of those vectors onto the other. And you can think about it either projecting this dr onto the f or projecting the f onto the dr. And so it gives you whatever component of this is acting in that direction. So our work from A to B is you add up all the little bits of force that are acting in the direction of motion as we travel from some initial position to some final position. This will have units then of force times a distance or newtons times meters, which we call joules after the scientist, where one joule is one newton meter. If we have a constant force where this force is not changing over time, then this can come out of that integral. It's a constant value. And now you just get the path length. And so you end up with your work for a constant force being the dot product of your force with the displacement, your final position minus your initial position where this displacement here, if we call it D, we now have work is equal to F dot D or F D cosine theta. Here with an example, we're pushing on a lawnmower. We have some force that's acting down towards the lawnmower if we're pushing directly in this way. And some of that is going downward. And some of that is going forward. Only, amount, only the amount of the force that is acting forward is contributing to the work. One way to think about this is that if you're not accomplishing anything, if you're not pushing in a direction where motion is happening, you're not actually doing any work. You might be exerting force, but nothing's happening. No work is actually being done. Let's do this with this actual example and look at work being done on this lawnmower. So we're exerting a constant force of 75 newtons at an angle 35 degrees below the horizontal, and we're pushing the mower 25 meters on level ground. How much work is that? That is F dot D or F D cosine theta, where our force is 75 newtons. Our distance is 25 meters. And the angle between them, this angle theta, gives us that cosine of that angle theta. We evaluate that and get 1.54 times 10 to the third joules. Or I might be tempted to write that as 1.54 kilojoules worth of work. So that's the amount of work that's done. It's not 
the total force, it's just the fraction of the force that's actually going in the direction of motion. Normally you would integrate, but here because we're applying a constant force, we can skip to the simpler form of that work expression. A couple mo more notes about work. If you have a perpendicular force, it doesn't do any work. What that means is that if you think about it, if you have a force that's not acting in the direction of motion, like a centripetal force, at every point, as you're going along a circular path, your velocity is always normal, or 90 degrees, to that centripetal force. And so that centripetal force is never pushing in the direction that you're actually moving, because this angle between them is always 90 degrees. When you take the cosine of 90 degrees, you get zero. So any perpendicular force, any force that's acting perpendicular to the direction of motion, is always going to do no work. Similarly, normal forces, you have a surface interaction, maybe something sliding along the surface, the normal force is always normal to that surface, it's never actually doing any work. In that same sort of vein, if you're directly opposing the direction of motion, you'll end up doing negative work. And this is because, if you think about it, you have, let's say, a box on a table. We try and slide that box to the right, so we have some direction of velocity to the right. The force of friction always opposes that direction of velocity, so it will always be opposite that. And that means that the angle between these two will always be 180 degrees. And the cosine of 180 degrees is negative one. So when you do work in a way where it's coming from a force that opposes a direction of motion, that amount of work will always end up as negative. 